it starts with Operation Crescent Wind, where coalition airstrikes destroy most of the Taliban's radar and command units, aircraft, and SA-2 and SA-3 surface-to-air missiles. The way is clear for ground forces, which brings four major special forces task forces, all under the leadership of General Tommy Franks, commander of the coalition forces. They are Combined Joint Task Force Mountain, the Joint Interagency Task Force Counterterrorism, Coalition Joint Civil Military Operations Task Force, and Combined Joint Special Operations Task Force, or JASODIF. This last one, the JASODIF, consists of three task forces. Colonel John Mulholland's Task Force Dagger, deployed to the north of Afghanistan, Dagger is partly there to liberate the oppressed in training guerrilla forces through infiltrating SF Operational Detachment Alpha teams. Task Force KBAR is led by Captain Robert Harward, a Navy SEAL. Structured with 16-man platoons, KBAR was used in part on recon and surveillance missions. KBAR also included Coalition Nation Special Forces, such as Canada's Joint Task Force II and Germany's Kommando Spezialkräfte. Then there is Task Force SWORD, the hunter-killer force, tasked with killing senior leadership and other targets of worth to the enemy. On October 19th, 12-man ODA 555, with the members of Jawbreaker, meet with warlord representatives of Fahim Khan, the latest military commander of the Northern Alliance, to begin joint operations. ODA 595 allies itself later that night, in spite of a treacherous sandstorm, with Uzbek warlord general Abdul Rashid Dostum, who has no love for the Taliban. A combat drop is staged in southern Afghanistan. Airmen from the 23rd Special Tactics Squadron and near 200 Army Rangers from 3rd Battalion 75th Ranger Regiment drop south of a Kandahar airstrip. The seizure of this strategic achievement is filmed and televised by the United States. The world and the Taliban are watching. A special forces team attempts to capture Taliban leader Mullah Omar in his compound. They do, however, find something nearly as valuable, intelligence. A firefight ensues against Taliban fighters, right before the operators are successfully extracted. The casualties, due to the classified nature of the mission, remain publicly unconfirmed. Coalition forces continue to work side by side with anti-Taliban Northern Alliance, be they on the ground, through airstrikes, or even on horseback. The city of Mazari Sharif, entrenched with Taliban fighters, falls in a day in a combination of ground forces and airstrikes. Another important and vital aspect of Operation Enduring Freedom was a psychological one. Flyers announcing the $25 million reward on bin Laden were dropped by the air, and civil affairs teams under Task Force Dagger moved into Mazari Sharif to win the trust of the Afghanis. Three days later, the capital city of Kabul is taken by General Fahim Khan and coalition forces, forcing Al-Qaeda and Taliban out to the mountains in East Afghanistan. More cities and villages fall until, on November 23rd, the Taliban officially surrender. Kandahar follows on December 6, 2001. Operation Enduring Freedom concludes in a mere 49 days from the start. It is a testimony to the effectiveness of special forces and their ability to not only fight, but to also lead the way to success. But bin Laden and many of his followers remain at large, having escaped to the eastern city of Jalalabad. There, they have access to the Tora Bora, a series of underground caves left over during their war against the Soviet Union years before they are a mere dozen miles from the Pakistani border. Special Forces operators team up with local militia to eliminate Al-Qaeda. The militia forces total near 3,000, led by ODA 572 and members of Jawbreaker. They also engage warlords Mohammad Zaman and Hazrat Ali. The fighting ends around December 17th, after nearly 1,000 Al-Qaeda retreat under cover of a false ceasefire with coalition forces. Several hundred Al-Qaeda are killed, and a coalition group, led by a SEAL platoon, clean up the 70 underground cages and 60 structures to gain intelligence. 
the Taliban regroup in 2002 and with Al-Qaeda, continue to fight the coalition forces, with Operation Anaconda launched to eliminate the remaining forces. With Anaconda concluded on March 19th, NATO established the International Security Assistance Force to help Afghanistan transition into a new government and to keep the Taliban from rising back up. With the Hussein regime in Iraq and the dictators once more firing on American aircraft, Iraq had been a sponsor of terrorism since the George H.W. Bush administration and Desert Storm. With Iraq's apparent ownership of weapons of mass destruction, the United States launched Operation Iraqi Freedom to depose Hussein. On my orders, coalition forces have begun striking selected targets of military importance to undermine Saddam Hussein's ability to wage war. These are opening stages of what will be a broad and concerted campaign. More than 35 countries are giving crucial support, from the use of naval and air bases to help with intelligence and logistics to the deployment of combat units. Every nation in this coalition has chosen to bear the duty and share the honor of serving in our common defense. To all the men and women of the United States Armed Forces now in the Middle East, the peace of a troubled world and the hopes of an oppressed people now depend on you. That trust is well placed. The enemies you confront will come to know your skill and bravery. The people you liberate will witness the honorable and decent spirit of the American military. In this conflict, America faces an enemy who has no regard for conventions of war or rules of morality. Saddam Hussein has placed Iraqi troops and equipment in civilian areas, attempting to use innocent men, women, and children as shields for his own military, a final atrocity against his people. General Tommy Franks and Brigadier General Gary Shooter Harrell, himself a Special Forces veteran, devise a strategy to depose Saddam Hussein that works on three fronts. Special Forces operators will scour deserts of western Iraq to destroy Scud tail launchers that can endanger air forces and provide reconnaissance. In the north, Special Forces will distract Iraqi forces from Baghdad by working with local guerrilla fighters and establish deployment sites for future forces. The special forces in the south will seize Hussein's oil resources and transportation hubs, while a covert unit will work on finding both weapons of mass destruction and high-ranking members of the Hussein regime. On March 20th, Operation Iraqi Freedom officially begins. Airstrikes, dubbed shock and awe, began. Military and special forces entered, sometimes covertly, from south, east, and west. Also present is the Naval Task Group, or NTG, assembled of Navy SEAL Teams 8 and 10, British Royal Marines of 40 and 42 Commandos, Polish Special Ops Grom, and U.S. PSYOP and Civil Affairs. Their mission is to procure Iraq's only deepwater port, Umm Qasr, and other oil pipeline facilities, including two platforms. It is a small force of Green Berets, only 26, divided into A-teams ODA-391 and ODA-392, tasked with capturing a junction between both Kirkuk and Mosul, near the village of Debeka. This pass will cleave Highway 2 and cut Iraqi movement in the north. Iraqi defenders stand watch on the Zarak Ziradag Ridge, overlooking the vital crossroads. B-52s unleash bombardment on the ridge, signaling for Green Berets from ODA-44 and 150 Peshmerga fighters to lay claim to Objective Rock, a T-junction that leads to the crossroads and the village. They will be given cover fire by ODA-391 and 392. North of them, 500 Peshmerga will advance on the ridge. Even further north, ODA-43 and their 150 Kurd guerrilla support will attack and siege the commanding hill called Objective Stone, with ODA's 394 and 395 providing fire support. ODA 044, 391, and 392 in the south of the war zone are forced to drive their ground mobility vehicles around the roadway to Objective Rock from a combination of dirt berms and mines laid by Iraqi forces. 
they encounter Iraqi bunkers, but quickly overtake them and continue to the Debeka Pass, eliminating resistance as they go. Three trucks approach the Green Berets. They hold fire when the drivers blink their headlights, assuming it a sign of surrender. But it is anything but. Smoke grenades are fired, concealing six Iraqi MTLB APCs that drive from the fumes, firing on the ODAs. The American 50 caliber machine gun rounds and MK-19 grenade launchers cause a slowing down of the APCs, but only so they can split apart to reveal four T-55 tanks no more than 900 yards away. Their only hope is in the Javelin anti-tank missiles outfitted to their GMVs. This fire-and-forget shoulder-mounted anti-tank missile uses infrared guidance. Upon firing, a rocket motor engages and flies the Javelin to its target. It also features seeker capabilities to hit a moving target. The Javelins, however, take time to warm up and arm. Their only option is to flee the 100mm gunfire from the T-55s by moving 900 meters back from the crossroads. This will be their Alamo, or last stand. The ODAs call for backup and learn it will take 30 minutes to arrive. They must hold off an overwhelming number of Iraqis for half an hour. Javelin missiles succeed in holding the encroaching forces back when air support arrives. Twin Navy F-14s fly onto the scene. The pilot of one jet, however, mistakes his target. The 2,000-pound bomb goes off amongst friendly forces, killing a dozen Peshmerga, wounding four coalition members, and injuring a BBC camera crew. The bombing does affect the Iraqi assault, leading some to surrender. Arriving on the scene, however, were six enforcers of the Ba'ath Party, who executed those Iraqis attempting to surrender. One T-55 is destroyed. Not long after, two Navy F-A-18s arrived and drove off the remaining Iraqi armor. Twenty-six Special Forces operatives held off a mechanized convoy of tanks and artillery. The Battle of Debeka Pass has gone down in the annals of the Special Forces. Hussein still eludes capture, but his sons Uday and Kusay are not so lucky. The brothers, along with Kusay's 14-year-old son, are hiding out in the Mosul suburb of Al Falah, in the home of their informer, who stands to collect 15 million for each brother. On July 22nd, 101st Airborne established a perimeter around the house. Delta operators stand ready for forced entry. Loudspeakers broadcast a chance for peaceful surrender. Uday and Kuze refuse to take it, forcing the Delta to push through the front door with flash grenades. They face off against small arms fire from the two. It will take two more attempts, punctuated with 50 caliber fire and AT-3 rockets, to finally gain entry. Kuse lies dead. Uday, armed and holed up in a bathroom and severely injured, is shot and killed by a Delta operator. Kusei's son opens fire, and the Delta operators are forced to shoot and kill him. Intelligence pinpoints the deposed dictator's location to a farm compound outside Aldor and south of Tikrit. Operation Red Dawn goes underway, with the 1st Brigade Combat Team, 4th Infantry, surrounding an accordion, and Delta operators from C Squadron searching two different locations, Wolverine 1 and Wolverine 2. Hussein is nowhere to be found. One operator, however, notices an exposed board. Kicking it aside, he reveals a spider hole. Before a fragment grenade can be dropped, Hussein reveals himself. A Delta operator hits him with the butt of his M4 carbine and disarms him of his Glock. Found within his hideout is an AK-47 and $750,000 in cash. His hair is unkempt and his beard grown out and scraggly. Hussein offers no resistance. An Iraqi special tribunal sentences him to death by hanging for crimes against humanity. Saddam Hussein, once dictator and mass murderer, is hanged to death on December 30, 2006. Barack Obama becomes the 44th President of the United States, with the specter of Osama bin Laden still looming. Two years into his term, the new president delivers on a mission started by his predecessor. Good evening. 
Tonight, I can report to the American people and to the world that the United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al-Qaeda, and a terrorist who's responsible for the murder of thousands of innocent men, women, and children. It was nearly 10 years ago that a bright September day was darkened by the worst attack on the American people in our history. The images of 9-11 are seared into our national memory. Hijacked planes cutting through a cloudless September sky, the Twin Towers collapsing to the ground, black smoke billowing up from the Pentagon, the wreckage of Flight 93 in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, where the actions of heroic citizens saved even more heartbreak and destruction. And yet we know that the worst images are those that were unseen to the world. The empty seat at the dinner table, the children who were forced to grow up without their mother or their father, parents who would never know the feeling of their child's embrace. Nearly 3,000 citizens taken from us, leaving a gaping hole in our hearts. On September 11, 2001, in our time of grief, the American people came together. We offered our neighbors a hand and we offered the wounded our blood. We reaffirmed our ties to each other and our love of community and country. On that day, no matter where we came from, what God we prayed to, or what race or ethnicity we were, we were united as one American family. We were also united in our resolve to protect our nation and to bring, to bring those who committed this vicious attack to justice. Today, at my direction, the United States launched a targeted operation against that compound in Abbottabad, Pakistan. A small team of Americans carried out the operation with extraordinary courage and capability. No Americans were harmed. They took care to avoid civilian casualties. After a firefight, they killed Osama bin Laden and took custody of his body. For over two decades, bin Laden has been al-Qaeda's leader and symbol, and has continued to plot attacks against our country and our friends and allies. The death of bin Laden marks the most significant achievement to date in our nation's effort to defeat al-Qaeda. Yet his death does not mark the end of our effort. There is no doubt that al-Qaeda will continue to pursue attacks against us. We must, and we will, remain vigilant at home and abroad. It is around 1 a.m. in Pakistan when 23 Navy SEALs and two different Black Hawk helicopters lower over the compound in Abbottabad. One crash lands into the compound, but fortunately, no one is injured. The SEALs, adept at rolling with a punch, land their second helicopter outside the compound and move out. The crashed helicopter's team blows open a door into the house, while the outside team blows a hole through another entrance. Before long, they are inside bin Laden's compound. It is dark inside. CIA operatives were sure to cut the power, leaving the terrorist mastermind in pitch black. A SEAL shoots and kills an armed courier, Ibrahim Saeed Ahmed. Abrar Ahmed, his brother, is shot dead by a SEAL, as is his wife. The SEALs encounter a metal door to the upper floors, which they blow open with C4 explosives. Bin Laden's 23-year-old son, Khalid, is shot dead by SEALs. In the third floor bedroom for 15 minutes in the dark is Osama Bin Laden. The SEALs shoot Osama Bin Laden on sight. Laying mortally wounded on his bedroom floor, SEALs fire killing shots directly into his chest. The raid lasts about 40 minutes. Five Al-Qaeda are shot and killed, including Bin Laden and an adult son. In Washington, D.C., President Obama is watching via drone footage. The SEALs collect as much evidence and intelligence as they can. Revealed is bin Laden's planned assassination attempt on the president's life and his plans to attack the United States on the 10th anniversary of the September 11th attacks. Even though the mastermind behind al-Qaeda is dead, terrorism still erupts in the Middle East. A new terrorist group, ISIL, or the Islamic State, comes to attention in 2013. 
In his final State of the Union address on January 12th, President Barack Obama stresses the need to approach ISIL differently than prior terrorist groups, such as Al-Qaeda. Priority number one is protecting the American people and going after terrorist networks. Both Al-Qaeda and now ISIL pose a direct threat to our people because in today's world, even a handful of terrorists who place no value on human life, including their own, can do a lot of damage. They use the internet to poison the minds of individuals inside our country. Their actions undermine and destabilize our allies. We have to take them out. But as we focus on destroying ISIL, over-the-top claims that this is World War III just play into their hands. Masses of fighters on the back of pickup trucks, twisted souls plotting in apartments or garages, they pose an enormous danger to civilians. They have to be stopped. But they do not threaten our national existence. That, that is the story ISIL wants to tell. That's the kind of propaganda they use to recruit. We don't need to build them up to show that we're serious. And we sure don't need to push away vital allies in this fight by echoing the lie that ISIL is somehow representative of one of the world's largest religions. We just need to call them what they are, killers and fanatics, who have to be rooted out, hunted down, and destroyed. And that's exactly what we're doing. For more than a year, America has led a coalition of more than 60 countries to cut off ISIL's financing, disrupt their plots, stop the flow of terrorist fighters, and stamp out their vicious ideology. With nearly 10,000 airstrikes, we're taking out their leadership, their oil, their training camps, their weapons. We're training, arming, and supporting forces who are steadily reclaiming territory in Iraq and Syria. If this Congress is serious about winning this war and wants to send a message to our troops and the world, Authorize the use of military force against ISIL. Take a vote. Take a vote. But the American people should know that with or without congressional action, ISIL will learn the same lessons as terrorists before them. If you doubt America's commitment, or mine, to see that justice is done, just ask Osama bin Laden. <laughs> ask, ask the leader of Al-Qaeda in Yemen, who was taken out last year, or the perpetrator of the Benghazi attacks, who sits in a prison cell. When you come after Americans, we go after you. And it may take time, but we have long memories and our reach has no limits. With the rules of war rewritten and the world changing at an unprecedented rate, it will take the might and savvy of the United States Special Forces to fight terrorism on a global scale. It may be on a battlefield in the desert, jungle, in a village or city, or even fighting cyber terrorists on their own digital turfs. The Special Operations Forces will be there. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe. 
to help keep history happening.